afternoon. I, uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of the Institute of Politics. The Institute of Politics began in January of this year, and our goal is to bring forums like this to the campus, practitioners uh, to the campus, uh, and uh, uh, engage in the uh, politics uh, and the public policy debates uh, of our time. And so this is an important uh, event for us. I can see that it's um, provoked a, a great deal of interest, which is, uh, which is great. Uh, and it should, because um, I think one thing that we can all agree on in this room is that uh, the quality of the education that we provide our kids is going to say a lot about the quality of the future uh, of not just their future, but the future of our country. All of us have concerns about um, the performance uh, generally uh, of, uh, of our kids and workers uh, relative to uh, some of our competitors around the world. Uh, we have concerns about inequality of opportunity between uh, school uh, districts around the country. These are, these are fundamental problems that we have to solve. And so uh, today we're having a discussion, as you know, about the Common Core Standards, which was an initiative uh, of, of, of uh, the uh, Obama administration. Uh, we're happy to welcome uh, Secretary Arne Duncan home to Chicago. I first met Arne uh, on this campus of, uh, when uh, I was a student here, and he was a young kid uh, playing basketball at Bartlett Gym. Uh, so I'm glad to see he's made something of his life. Um, and uh, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, one of our uh, students who will introduce the panel uh, tonight. Or, and we'll, this will be a discussion in two parts. By the way, I know there are a lot of teachers in the room, and I'm really, really pleased to see that. And I hope when question and answer period comes that you will engage uh, in this discussion. Uh, as well, and I honor you uh, for what you do. Uh, teachers are on the front line every day, and we, uh, we appreciate them and we value them. Uh, Matthew Collins is a third year in the college. He's studying public policy and sociology with a specialization in education policy. He is also a founder and co-president of Block 58, a new stu student organization that aims to provide students with opportunities to learn about, engage in, and influence education policy uh, on a local level. Please welcome Matthew Collins. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, this afternoon is all about the Common Core, a huge initiative uh, and a set of new learning standards that aims to prepare students for a 21st century economy by emphasizing critical thinking skills and math concepts. For many, the Common Core remains a mystery, even as, the state, uh, as states, like Illinois, uh, begin implementing the adopted standards. What exactly is the Common Core? How does it affect teachers and students in classrooms? What does it look like across districts and across states? These questions are continuously being asked. Joining us to answer these questions are three experts that will give us valuable insights in order to help us better understand the Common Core. We are honored to have U.S. Secretary of Education Arne Duncan. Prior to becoming Secretary of Education, Duncan served as the CEO of Chicago Public Schools, from where he was recognized for raising student performance and increasing graduation rates. He was raised right here in Hyde Park and began his pursuits in education by helping his mother run after school and summer programs uh, in the North Kenwood neighborhood. During his time as U.S. Secretary of Education, he helped secure congressional support for Obama's investments in education, including $100 billion through the American Recover and Recovery and Reinvestment Act to fund teaching jobs, increases in Pell Grants, and reform eff efforts such as Race to the Top. In addition, he has led new efforts to encourage labor and management to work together, and their new collaboration is helping to drive reform, strengthen teaching, create better educational op options, and improve learning. Joining Secretary Duncan this afternoon is Frederick Hess, an educator, political scientist, and author. Hess studies issues in K-12 and higher education. His most recent book, Cage Busting Leadership, shares how current and aspiring leaders can cultivate and sustain powerful cultures of teaching and learning. His work has appeared in scholarly and popular outlets, such as Har the Harvard Education Review, Phi Delta Kappen, The Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and The Atlantic. 
A former high school social studies teacher, he has also taught at the University of Virginia, University of Pennsylvania, Georgetown, Rice, and Harvard University. And finally, our moder moderator is Tim Knowles, and he serves as the John Dewey Director of the UChicago's Urban Education Institute. Prior to coming to Chicago, Knowles served as Deputy Superintendent for Teaching and Learning at the Boston Public Schools. While in Boston, he created two organizations devoted to building the pipeline of high quality teachers and school leaders for Boston Public Schools. And he served as co-director of the Boston Annenberg Challenge, a nationally recognized efforts to improve literacy instruction. He has also written and spoken, spoken extensively on the topics of school leadership, teacher quality, school reform, and accountability in public schools. Please join me, join, please join me in welcoming our distinguished guests. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here. And those of you up there in the peanut gallery, welcome too. See, they're rowdy. You can tell. They're, they're, um, um, and Arnie, welcome home. It's been probably 30 years since I've been in this room. But <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to jump right in. And um, with this as a framing, the Common Core, I think, is arguably the most ambitious effort to improve the quality of teaching and learning in the United States in a generation. For those of the audience here who don't know what the Common Core state standards are, can you give us a quick overview? So the Common Core state standards are a set of standards that uh, teachers, uh, school, state, uh, school chief officers, governors, starting in about 2007, started to work together with the basic goal being to raise the bar. That in far too many states, and frankly, uh, I think not insignificantly because of No Child Left Behind, you had about 20 states actually dummy down standards to make politicians look good. So we were telling kids they were on track to be successful. We were actually lying to them, lying to their families. For me, it's one of the most insidious things that happened in education. And there were a set of political leaders, education leaders, who said we need to do something better. And the Common Core state standards, uh, they were voluntarily adopted by 46 states. Folks thought that would never happen. Um, are a set of standards that hope to guarantee that if you know this body of knowledge when you graduate from high school, you are truly college and career ready. And we know not only do we have devastating dropout rates here in Chicago and across the country, we lose a million kids uh, from our schools to our streets each year, but far too many who actually graduate from high school have to take remedial classes. They're not ready. And these are kids that have played by all the rules, who have worked hard, but the expectations simply haven't been there. So that's the standards and great, great leadership from the states. How you teach those standards is something very different. That's curriculum. And that's something we should never touch at the federal level. That, to me, is always best determined at the local level. We're actually prohibited by law. And I think it would be the height of arrogance, frankly, even if we weren't prohibited by law, for us to play there. Local communities, be it Chicago or ours in Wheeling today, or rural communities or Native American reservations, they know their communities and their kids. They know the best way to teach to high standards. But to have a high bar for every child in the country rich, poor, black, white, Latino, doesn't matter. For me, it's not just the right thing in terms of our nation's economic future, but it's a hugely, hugely important equity play. And uh, you and I both have young children. Our kids, if they went to school, high standards, low standards, our kids are going to do pretty OK because they have educated parents. But it's the kids who don't have all those advantages who always get to hurt the most when things get dummy down. And that's been a rebellion against that. So you've, you've made the argument, moral argument, economic argument, educational argument, um, what gives you confidence that the students, teachers, and school leaders in our country can, can hit the bar or, or surpass well, it? I both have tremendous confidence, but this is going to be a heck of a lot of hard work. So what's happened to this point is states actually adopted the standards. That's a policy change. That's an important first step. That is actually the easy part of this. And the hard part of it is implementation. And helping give teachers the skills and support them in this hard work is critically important. Talking to students about what's going to be expected of them is hugely important. Better, articul better articulating to parents what they need to do to be supportive. Um, there's a huge amount of work over the next three, four, five, ten years that has to happen. Some states, some districts are further ahead of others. Um, but am I confident at the end of the day? I'm 100% confident. I am absolutely confident. Whenever we raise the bar, whenever we challenge people to do more, you know, particularly children, particularly disadvantaged communities, they always, they always hit that bar. So 
we've tried this in some ways 50 times in 50 states in different iterations with standards and, and assessments on the other side. Yeah. And yet, as you just said, one thing the state has done, states have done is dummy, them, dummy down, the, water down the standards or water, lower the benchmark for proficiency. Why do you think in this case it's going to be different? Um, I think there's more political will and courage that this is the right thing to do, as you said, educationally, morally, in terms of our country's economic competitiveness. There's basically a sense that enough was enough. And for me, this is just really personal. Just to you know, go back quickly, when I was in Chicago Public Schools, we had the consortium right here at the, uh, at the university did such great research. And we had test scores improving, graduation rates were getting better, and we were you know, feeling really good about ourselves, thinking we were moving things in the right direction. We knew we had a long way to go. But one, uh, we had a staff retreat every summer, and John Easton, who ran the consortium, would come every summer. And he came and he documented that if kids were hitting the state proficiency level, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, they were basically on track to get about a 16 on the ACT. They weren't even in the game. You have to get about a 20 to be successful. And it was like this unbelievable punch in the gut for us. But guess what? It was the truth. We basically told our team, we're not even going to talk about the state proficiency cut score anymore. Our kids have to be advanced. If they're not advanced, we're actually setting them up for failure. We're not getting them there. And so I think there's just been a recognition around the country that our children must do better, can do better. We have to raise the bar for them, and we have to work together. No Child Left Behind, again, I think had many, many huge issues. One of the biggest ones I always talk about, it was very, very loose on goals. So 50 different goalposts, 50 different standards, again, about 20 states, Republican, Democrat, dummy down standards, but very tight, very prescriptive on how you get there, dictated what you do. For me, that's just absolutely the wrong theory of change, and we're trying to flip that on its head. What we are encouraging through our policies, through the waivers with states, is to be tight on goals, high standards, college and career ready standards, but much looser. Give folks the flexibility at the local level to be creative, to be innovative, to hit that higher bar. So tight on goals, loose on the means to get there. And what's most important to me, Tim, common is critical. What's most important, though, is high. And so we've had states we've partnered with Minnesota, Virginia, most recently Texas, which might surprise people here, who didn't opt to go into the Common Core. We just said either join something that has a high bar or just demonstrate to us with your institutions of higher education if they can certify that if children are hitting this mark, graduate from high school, that they're prepared to take college level classes, don't have to take remedial classes, that's good enough for us. So for me, common is good, but what is most important is high standards. So I want to switch and talk about some of the risks embedded in this, political and educational risks. And, and I think um, I, I see at least three. So I'm going to see if I can cover them it's probably about one, ten, so. one by one. <laughs> um, starting with the educational risks, because you suggested it isn't the role of the, of the government, the federal government, to, to, to get involved in the middle. We've got standards and we've got assessments forthcoming. But in the middle is instruction, professional development, school culture, climate, the, 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 profession, the, the, the guts, diagnostic assessment, the guts of schooling. The, 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 there hasn't been a lot of cases where just doing standards and assessments have actually penetrated yeah. that core. What is it that makes us feel confident that, that whether it's textbook companies really adjusting what they're, what they're putting between the covers, um, but, but probably more, more importantly, the, the actual day-to-day -day work of teaching and teachers, that that will change. Um, I think the, that's, you're hitting, I think, the, by far the most important issue. It's great to raise standards. It's great to have the next generation of assessments. We can talk about that in a moment. But if you're not helping teachers and principals, students themselves, and parents with the hard work of implementation, we're kidding ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're not even in the game. And so this is an area where I think we all have to do a much, much better job of supporting teachers and administrators, again, families and students, of what this really means. And it's one thing to raise the bar. You have to provide the additional support as well. To me, those are always two sides of the same coin. And it's really interesting. I've been very public on this. I'm not making news. Um, at the federal level, on professional development, which is Title II money, we spend federally $2.5 billion a year, billion. If you throw in states and district money, it's probably five to $6 billion. And I go out and talk to hundreds and hundreds of teachers almost on a weekly basis. When I tell teachers that we spend $2.5 billion a year on their professional development, they either laugh or cry. They're not feeling it. And so I'm always going to be the greatest advocate for more resources, more investment, 
but we have to look ourselves in the eye and be honest and self-critical, and we are not supporting young teachers you know, thoughtfully enough. We don't have mentor and master teachers. We don't have good enough career ladders. We need to invest a heck of a lot, a heck of a lot more, but we have to make sure the dollars that we are, we are all spending are actually making a difference for teachers doing this hard work every single day. And I'm trying to sort of radically empower teachers in that. I'm asking teachers to challenge their principals, challenge their districts to be part of the conversation. You should know what your school spends on PD each year. You should know what the district spends and what the state spends. And if you're not feeling that money, if that's not helping you do your very difficult job better, then we're, we're not doing the right thing. We're not doing the right thing for teachers. We're not doing the right thing by, tax, by taxpayers either. So we're sitting, here, here's risk number two in my view. I think on some level, um, higher education and its ability to change makes Chicago public schools and the federal government look nimble. I, I, I'm just saying <laughs> that, that, that part of this depends on, on, on the teacher pipeline, the front end of the teacher pipeline, actually shifting in a fundamental way and that, that the places that are training and thinking about teaching and, and uh, developing aspiring teachers do some things f really differently. What, what, what are the levers that we need to press to make sure, in addition to your, your bully pulpit, to make sure that, that that actually happens? Because without that, it strikes me that we're going to be doing a lot of remediation of teachers over time. Yeah, so there are some funding mechanisms that we have and are looking at, but let me just go, get, get right to the crux of the matter. If you talk to young teachers, if you survey young teachers, about three quarters of them said they were unprepared to enter the classroom. And I always say if three, three quarters of doctors said they were un unprepared to practice medicine, we'd have a revolution in this country. But somehow we don't value teachers and teaching and education enough to really challenge that. And as I talk to great young teachers, they tell me two things. One, not enough just hands-on classroom experience. Lots of theory of education, history of education, philosophy of education, psychology of education. Not enough, how do I teach this group of 25 or 30 or 35 or 40 diverse poverty-stricken, ELL, special ed, how do I actually have an impact in their lives? I have the best of intentions, I'm in it for all the right reasons, teachers are the most altruistic people in the world, but you have to give them a chance to, to succeed. Uh, three issues, that's one. Secondly, they have, to ha they have to know the content. Math teachers have to know math, science teachers have to know science. And we do, I think, generally, not always, but generally a very poor job of giving teachers the reading strategies, knowing the math content, knowing the science they need to be successful. And the final thing that young teachers tell me is, you know, technology is transforming everything. And you have teachers who are helping each other. You have formative assessments where on a daily basis teachers are figuring out not what did I teach, but what did my children actually learn. Very few of them are learning that in their schools of bed because their professors have been out of the classroom for 10, 15, 20 years. So how do we get more hands-on practical experience? How do we get more content knowledge? And how do we help them with technology when they're an undergrad? Those are the changes that they are desperately asking for. And how do we move to sort of a, more of a residency model, a, med a medical model where they can train and apprentice with master, a mentor master teachers? Those are our people. We have a residency <laughs> model he here at the University of Chicago. It's hugely the, important. Um, it's hugely the, important. The, um, uh, d digging one step deeper, in 1987, 96 uh, research institutions with schools of education and their leaders put forward this report called the Holmes Report, which I don't know if I paid any attention to it in 1987, but it said in essence something quite radical because it came from schools of education, and I wonder whether you will endorse it. It said basically that we should eliminate the undergraduate education degree and, and teachers should learn a subject matter, content area, eliminate them. And uh, th since 1987, we've had a lot of evidence to suggest that, that people coming in with strong content backgrounds but no education training can actually get up to speed okay. and even surpass um, others with the appropriate kind of residency and clinical preparation. So uh, given we've, we're saying to children in America, this, the, the content just went up here. Not more of it, but, but certainly higher. Yeah. a higher set of standards. Shouldn't this be the moment where we're revisiting those sorts of proposals that would, would um, ensure that all teachers in America have know something, have a content background? Yeah. So this is a, a status quo that is absolutely unacceptable and we have to challenge it multiple fronts. I always think there are simplistic headline catching answers that people sort of jump at. The reality is always more complex than that. So I would generally argue both and. Um, many schools of education need to change. 
I would say the majority of schools of education need to change. I've also been in some wonderful schools that are doing a great job. But again, those that are doing it are blending both the, the education piece, but also the content knowledge as well. And there are more and more uh, hybrid programs, things that you are doing, you teach and others in the math and science and STEM fields, where you're seeing people start to work together in some very interesting ways. You're also seeing some alternative schools of ed be created that are, again, early on, but pretty promising. So I don't think in any of these things there's a silver bullet. I think that oversimplifies things. But the fundamental question is how do we radically improve uh, the training that hardworking, committed young teachers have? And let me just be clear, Tim, that also the undergrad piece is a hugely important, I would say, largely broken part. But I would say the whole pipeline throughout the teacher's career is also largely broken. Again, young teachers don't get the mentoring and support they need. We don't have the master mentor teachers. We don't have real career ladders. I've been very public in arguing we should double starting teacher salaries. Great teachers should make two or three times more money. Principals should make a heck of a lot more money. We need to invest. So yes, let's work that. But let's work from 18 all the way to 58 or 68 year olds as well. That whole thing needs a fundamental overhaul. So I'd be remiss, and David Axelrod would probably do me in if I didn't raise the politics of this um, endeavor that you've embarked on. And, and there's, there's a slight measure of irony that I'm here sitting with the Secretary of Education talking about a state level standards initiative. Um, but in essence, one risk, one political risk, is a set of very strange bedfellows coming together. On one hand, you've got the Tea Party, uh, who are arguing that this is a big national conspiracy to drive a national curriculum down, um, to, the down to every schoolhouse in America. And that movement has shown itself in various states across this country of both red and blue. On the other, you've got um, organized labor, for example, who are arguing, in some cases, let's hold off on any stakes attached to the assessments that will come. Or I was in St. Paul yesterday, and you've got the teachers union there saying, we don't want any standardized tests anymore. They just want to stop them entirely. We got a crowd for that. So you've got, you've got, a, you've got a, a growing body of, of Americans who, whether by virtue of No Child Left Behind or otherwise, have said assessment is the villain. So in light of these politics, Tea Party politics, labor politics, sort of the, the, the sort of perception that we're over assessing kids to the, to the point where we're tracking away from what the core enterprise should be, how do you, how do you think about these politics? And, and what, what do not just you do, but what do people interested in actually raising the standards do to, to countervail? So again, all of these are it's a great question. These are complex, hard, difficult issues. But I always think there's a common sense middle. <laughs> and it's important to play there and not play to the extreme. So let's take them one at a time. Um, you know, there's a set of Tea Party folks who think that you know, raising standards is somehow a bad thing or we shouldn't be encouraging that. I just, again, just come to this as a parent. Do we want more for our children or do we want less? Um, what we never talk about, too, is, to, again, 50 different standards, 50 different goalposts. Think about military families. And we all want to support the military and we support military families. Think of their mobility. Think of the mobility that so many of our families have today and move from one state to the other and these radically different things going on. Is that the right thing to do? And so many of the Tea Party conspiracy theories, well, they're just not true. I mean, there's a decent percent of the Tea Party thinks the president's a Muslim from Kenya. You know, it's just not, facts are sort of irrelevant. And so I think just being honest, being straightforward, continuing to tell the truth is very important. Um, Rick Hester's going to come on, and others have said, well, we're giving them fodder by us talking about it. Um, I think it's important for us to tell the truth. Um, we deal with, you guys know this better than me, devastating gun violence in this city, in this state, in this country. I'm going to keep talking about common sense gun control. Tea Party doesn't like it. We get pushed back on that. We've got far too many kids in Chicago public schools being killed each year. And so I think I have a moral obligation. We need high standards. We need fewer guns on the streets. That's the right thing to do. Um, on the other side, on the left, I think there's, again, there's a common sense middle ground. People tend to forget, when actually when I was here in CPS, we cut out about 50% of the testing. We were taking the state test, and we were taking the Iowa test. I couldn't figure out why our kids in Chicago were taking the Iowa test, so we eliminated that. Um, but to say there should be no assessment Candidly, I don't agree with that either. And I think we can absolutely over-test. I think there has been probably too much testing in many, many places. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we all want to know, are our, are our children learning each year? Are they progressing? If they start the year ninth grade taking algebra, what do they know at the start of the year? And what do they know at the end of the year? 
And I think we all know great teachers do an amazing job of helping give kids opportunity, regardless of socioeconomic background and where they are. So I'm not interested in absolute test scores. I want to look at growth and gain. One of the things we've done with, no, with uh, waivers with No Child Left Behind is move away from a focus on a single test score and a proficiency cut score. We're looking at growth and gain. We're looking at our graduation rates going up, our dropout rates going down. Are more students who graduate from, college, from high school actually going to college? Are they going to college and not taking remedial classes? Are they actually ready? Are they persevering? So we're trying to have a much more thoughtful, nuanced, sophisticated set of metrics to look at accountability beyond a single test score. So I think in all these things, there's a middle ground that makes sense, and the vast majority of the American public understands that. But these conversations, these debates, I think are really important to have, and we should be very open and honest and agree and agree to disagree and work them through. And let me be really clear, you know, this is going to be a work in progress, and this is not going to be perfect. There are going to be bumps. There are going to continue to be hurdles. There's nothing easy about this. Um, but the question is, do we want to go back to dummy down standards? Are we comfortable with a 25% dropout rate in this country? Are we comfortable with, in many of our African-American and Latino communities, 40, 50, 60 percent dropout rates? Um, or do our kids in our country deserve something better? Well, thank you, Arnie. That was um, a, a, the best primer I've heard on the Common Core since it was unveiled. So I, I really appreciate it. I'm now going to complicate this conversation further by inviting Rick Hess, an economist, a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, a provocative um, rock star pundit to join me. There he is. <laughs> Just going on so, for a second time. Hey, how are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. So, Rick, um, given what you just heard, what, what are your top worries about the Common Core? What are top of mind? And it's tough to be up here with you because folks may not know, about eight or ten years ago, Tim was voted one of the best looking men in uh, education. <laughs> <laughs> I still flash on that. You can see what happens in eight and ten years, right? It's a sad, sad state of affairs. You go for the secretary's kind of distinguished. Yeah, exactly. um, so first, l let me start by saying that uh, you can certainly make, I think, a very compelling case for the Common Core. Uh, the secretary mentioned the fact that there's enormous mobility in this country. And the idea that you're going to pick up reading in second or fifth grade at a very different place than when you, before you moved doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, there's real problems in terms of figuring out which instructional approaches or which learning tools are more effective when we can't keep score consistently and we have no way to compare things. So I think one can very easily and readily make a strong and coherent case for the value of states having common standards. But I have enormous concerns about the way this has unfolded. Let me just take off a couple. Um, one is a common core is just a bunch of words on paper. Uh, David Coleman, who was kind of the motivating architect behind this, sat me down for a couple hours when the first draft was released, and I think they're perfectly reasonable standards. Um, I've never been a standards aficionado. I think a lot of people say the Common Core is great, who actually have no idea how do you distinguish good from bad standards. Um, I don't know how you distinguish great from bad standards. Um, but they seem perfectly reasonable and per perfectly useful. I'm not as convinced as a secretary that they are clearly higher clearly more powerful and compelling. But they're just words on paper. Everything that actually matters about standards, like we've just heard you and the Secretary talking about, is really the question of implementation. And I really worry there on two counts. One is I think the advocates behind the Common Core pocketed a whole bunch of quick victories early on when they got a whole bunch of states to adopt the Common Core. Uh, this was partly aided, as the Secretary has acknowledged, by the inducement to states um, as part of Race to the Top, to sign on for Common Core or something like it. Of course, there's nothing else like it, so they sign on for Common Core. Um, it was partly because it's a condition for states to get NCLB waivers from the department uh, that they've been required. Um, and it's also partly because there was a lot of encouragement and support from folks like the Gates Foundation. And what happened was 40-odd states signed up for this stuff without anybody having any idea what was going on, what it amounted to, without public hearings or public debate. And so folks woke up in 2012 and they started to hear about this thing. And this is a huge problem because the Common Core is not self-executing. You need state legislators to allocate funds to actually do all the kinds of things the Secretary was talking about. You need publishers to retool their lines, the instructional materials. You need broad fundamental change, like the Secretary talked about in teacher preparation and in professional development. 
And frankly, I have little or no confidence that very much of that is underway in any imp important form. Frankly, right now, I don't think many states are going to abandon the Common Core. I just think they're going to do it in ways that treat it as little more than words on paper. And what we're going to wind up with is five or six years of disruption and all of the oxygen sucked out of the room and a lot of confusion and turmoil. And it's going to be the biggest flop since, you know, since Y2K. So that was actually a, a, a rave success, as I recall. <laughs> no, 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 no. no problem. <laughs> Nothing changed. No problem. Yeah. So then to push you from the armchair critic role, what, what, what then? So sure. what, 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 where, where does the opportunity lie? Where, where, what would you push if you were in Arnie's shoes? Where, what levers would you be pressing? Uh, you know, it's, it's always infinitely easier to be an armchair quarterback <laughs> than to actually be in Arnie's shoes. Right. And uh, yeah, it's good to keep in mind. Uh, so a couple things. One, I've argued long that it was a mistake to talk about retooling teacher evaluation and accountability systems at the same time you were rolling out new assessments. Um, I hardly ever say anything audiences like. This is really fun. Um, so welcome to the University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> um, Look, look um, I, I, you know, I have, I, I'm with the secretary on the value of accountability on teacher evaluation. Um, none of us like actually having that kind of pressure in our work day to day, but I think it is a good and helpful thing when done well. I sure as heck don't want people changing the metrics and the scoring just as we are rolling out new evaluation systems. And I think, unfortunately, because of the way states were encouraged to adopt these, the race to the top and NCLB waivers, that it was ensured that dozens of states were going to be piloting these systems at the exact same time they're rolling out Common Core and assessments. So I actually am much closer to, say, Montgomery County Superintendent Josh Starr and thinking that we ought to hold up um, on the, you know, on, on, as we stage these transitions. Se so keep push go on teacher evaluations and hold or up one or the on other. one I, or the other. I, I, I'm much more right. afraid that the, the one you, you can do, you can either start to make these metrics count for teachers or you can start changing the assessments that you're using to evaluate teachers in schools, but I am personally uh, uncomfortable with doing both simultaneously. Um, a second thing that I think is we've been, I think the Common Core advocates have been just fundamentally dishonest about, um, is that, there, that there's a lot, uh, that there's a, something of a, a little bit pregnant syndrome or, or, around the Common Core adoption. Um, that we talk a lot about how it's a state-led initiative, and it's true it was driven by the NGA and CCSS, the Council of Chief State School Officers and Superintendents. But the reality is that many of the challenges that are implied by what Tim and the Secretary were talking about um, are going to be very difficult for states and districts to handle on their own. Right now, if you go on Amazon right now, you will find more than 30,000 materials that pop up uh, if you search for Common Core. Uh, you can find textbooks that were issued before the Common Core was drafted, which bear stickers which say aligned to the Common Core. Uh, there is not a state in this country, uh, I, 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 I'm projecting, that is actually going to have the technology infrastructure in place uh, to do either PARC or the Smarter Balanced Assessments uh, online in 2015. Uh, these are real challenges, and I think there's going to be a lot of push uh, for either the Department of Education or for a national effort to help address these. And what's going to happen, and I think we saw this happen with NCLB, where the promise was, no, 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 it's not a federal thing. States will write their own standards, write their own rules. And what we saw 10 years later was that it, No Child Left Behind became very much a mechanism for the administration through waivers, getting very deeply engaged in state policy making and state decisions. And I think the skeptics and those concerned about federal overreach are being dismissed as know nothing or Luddites or folks worried about the president's ancestry. I think they are not getting just a reasonable hearing and reasonable debate about what are the bright lines that they can be confident we're not on a slippery slope to the federal government playing an increasingly intrusive role in professional development and teacher evaluation and uh, assessment uh, selection. Uh, in, in curriculum and instructional materials, because right now, it seems to me the conversation over the last 18 months has been one which certainly poses a number of slippery slopes and very little evidence of bright lines to guard against those. So I want to turn this way, Arnie, and, and ask what your sort of counterpoint is to, 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 to some of Rick's um, critique, because I didn't actually hear a lot of solutions in, oh. in the narrative. I heard 
don't do oh, teacher sure. evaluation. Oh, right. so, on, 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 so on that point, I, I think, look, so I think the first solution is to get past this little bit pregnant syndrome. I think most of the advocates of Common Core are really and truly not all that concerned about increasing the federal role in education. When they say most nations across the world have national standards, most nations across the world are also have a national government that's deeply involved right. in prescribing things throughout. So I think it would be useful to be honest about that and where they're trying to take the conversation. Or my preferred course would be uh, for the secretary to say, look, the federal government put a thumb on the scale uh, and raised the top in waivers. What's done is done. I completely respect that the secretary of administration think this was the right and appropriate thing to do. Um, but I would, th I would personally feel much more comfortable that these were going to be state-led common standards, and if the NGA and CCSSO were gonna come up with solutions to this stuff, as a state collective, that would be fine, but I would love to hear the Department of Education uh, issue a proclamation that yes, we are opposed to any further waivers being contingent on anything related to state adoption of standards or standard-aligned assessments, that's not our business. I would like to see the Federal Department of Education uh, make clear uh, what are the bright lines that states can actually expect when it comes to guidance on professional development, on selection of materials, on teacher evaluation. And uh, frankly, I would like to see uh, some private initiatives step up to help states and districts with the selection of instructional materials, to help with this question of sequencing of teacher, and school, uh, teacher evaluation and school accountability in the Common Core, um, and to explain how the heck we're actually going to, how we're going to technologically enable these assessments. Uh, given the current state of affairs without federal intrusion. Uh, if those conditions were put in place, I personally would be much more comfortable that this is going to unfold the way the advocates have suggested it will. Arnie? There's a lot there. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> some I agree, some I disagree. So, I, you know, I'll just be very candid and I have a lot of respect for Rick. Um, I think there are actually very clear lines in many of these things. So I unap unapologetically advocate for higher standards. And again, I think we have done a devastating disservice to millions of poor and disadvantaged kids in this country by having low expectations for them. And we have condemned them to poverty and social failure. And a big part of the federal role is to protect the most vulnerable kids. And so we will never mandate, we will never do whatever, but we will encourage. And again, the goal was not common, the goal was high. And I go back to the example of Minnesota and Virginia and Texas, where we might not agree with everything politically with Governor Rick Perry, but the goal was high standards, they demonstrated that. And I think saying the goal to have kids actually college and career ready once they graduate from high school, I find that hard to debate. What's fascinating to me, it makes a good point, should we have more debate, more conversation? Absolutely. When 19, 20 states dummy down standards, where was the outcry? Where was the debate then? Who called politicians, Republican, Democrat, for doing the wrong thing to make themselves look good? Who fought for kids? There was a deafening silence there. So that's one bright line. Secondly, on curriculum, there's absolutely, we will never touch that. And again, if we do that, I violate the law, I go to jail, never have talked about it, never have touched that. That's always best done at the local level, we stay out of that. On uh, teacher evaluation, we can't dictate what happens, but a big part of what Title I and Title II at the federal level is about trying to help poor and disadvantaged kids. Great teachers, great principals make a huge difference. The example I've given is that historically, these things have been broken for 40, 50 years. I give the California example. California has about 300,000 teachers, 300,000. I always say the top 10%, top 30,000, are arguably some of the best teachers in the world, literally, world class. Bottom 10%, bottom 30,000, either should be getting significant help or maybe shouldn't be teaching. And no one, no one in California can tell you who's in what category. And so to defend the status quo, for me, it's just absolutely untenable. Now, we are absolutely, to Rick's point, we are pushing a lot of change in a short amount of time. And maybe in a perfect world, you do it over 10 or 15 years. I just don't think our kids can wait that long. And we always let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We debate this stuff. We have had meaningless teacher evaluations that didn't support excellence, didn't shine a spotlight on it. We didn't learn from that. We didn't help the teachers in the middle who needed the help. And we didn't move out those at the bottom where after help and support and guidance, it wasn't working. We haven't done any of that forever. And somehow that's okay. Somehow that's okay. So promoting higher standards, absolutely. Let's keep debating this stuff. Stay absolutely away from curriculum. But if we care about kids, teacher quality, principal quality, we have to have that conversation. And again, recognize, the, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. 
keep iterating, keep, keep trying to get better, work through this, but to just sort of stand back and let's wait another 10 or 15 years and see what happens. Kids you work with here, the kids I work with here, they don't have that long. We're gonna to move to you now um, and open the floor. I think there's a couple of microphones in the, in the aisle here. So if you have a question, um, keep it brief or I will start moderating. Thank you. I have a question. My name is Maggie Steins. Um, I am an Illinois adult educator with a 45 year career in education administration and never stopped teaching at least part time. I worked on the eighth floor doing grants for specialized services when you were at the Chicago Public Schools, Secretary Duncan. And I'm in the hall of the Cameron and Heckman study for GED. I've been in alternative ed, working with the hardest to reach, most in need, most vulnerable students in terms of uh, being in trouble with the law and dropping out of school. And the GED is actually and was developed on the core standards of what the average high school dropout, uh, the average high school graduate retained after graduation. Every year it's renormed and you know a new one is rolling out this year. Um, and I don't know what the most recent one is, but every time it was renormed and taken for a test drive before it was put out to the public, it was tested on high school graduates recently with a diploma random sample. Consistently since World War II, one third of the people with a high school diploma couldn't pass the GED. So that's the kick in the standards yeah. um, going all the way through. There is a project that was funded heavily by Gates there, called RISC. You have, can you get your question? Yes, RISC yeah. in Wasilla, Wisconsin, or it was Wasilla, uh, Alaska, that is doing report cards on this. So my question is this. Standards are necessary, but they're not necessarily taught in the context of critical thinking. They're taught for a result. And students can come up, if you ask them, for example, to change a decimal to a percent, they can tell you, move it two places to the right. Question? Left. You ask them what operation, they can't tell you. So my question is, what is being done to really embed, enforce, and encourage critical thinking and creative things through the arts and so forth to support education? You know yourself, those people involved in the arts do better Thank than you. academics. So what's going to be done and come forward with that? So a couple things. Um, one of my real concerns, both in part due to No Child Left Behind and due to tough budgetary times, far too many communities cut the arts out. And that's a devastating, devastating impact on kids that need it. And whether it's dance or drama or arts or music, for me it was sports, academic decathlon, yearbook, robotics, chess team, all those things are so hugely important to keeping kids engaged in school and give them a reason in a cold Chicago January day to get up and go to school. And if we're serious about reducing dropouts, if we're serious about having our kids be successful, Maybe it's algebra trig, maybe it's not. Maybe it's being in the courts. Maybe it's being in the school play. And we have to help kids find their passion. So not just in high school, but second and third and fourth and fifth grade all the way up. So I worry a lot when we walk away from those things. For me, those are not extras. Those have to be core to what I call a world-class, well-rounded education. And we're doing everything we can to fight to increase investment and to make sure that's the norm. And Again, it's no, not lost to me. I went to lab schools here, an amazing school, amazing private school. Those are the kinds of experiences that me and my sister and brother had every single day. That is not the norm in CPS and other inner city communities. And those are the kids that need it the most. And so we have to, as a country, we're either going to invest or not. And I always say, if you, know, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. That's, we want to move on to another question. Um, so wh who has the microphone? Mr. Staines. Uh, just want to thank you very, very much, Arnie. I think that you are one of the real bright spots in the Washington firmament. And I know you and your family have a long commitment to helping the least advantaged kids. And I think setting the higher standards and getting away from this benign neglect is long overdue. We're trying very hard to include all the uh, progressive things you might do on teacher evaluation. Can't we qualify for a waiver from No Child Left Behind? We're only one of seven. <laughs> First of all, thanks for your family's long, long time commitment. It's great to see you. So we are uh, continuing to work with Illinois and uh, work it through. There are now 40 models that Illinois can, can work, but I have a lot of respect here. Let me tell you one question, just a little bit off top, but I just want to get to raising standards is really important. All the things we talked about, but I'll be really clear. None of this is the magic bullet. None of this is going to solve the world's problems by themselves. And I just want to be, you know, I'm traveling the country like a maniac, pushing as hard as I can on early childhood education. And I would argue that's the best investment we can make. We have to get our babies off to a good start. 
We had a little bit on the well, well-rounded curriculum. Again, how we reduce dropout rates. Chicago Public Schools today, you have about uh, 35,000 ninth graders. You have about 22, 23,000 12th graders. You're losing about 12,000 kids between ninth and 12th grade every single year. That's a stadium full. Where are they going? What opportunities do they have? And so these are the kinds of things we need to be focused on together. This stuff, I think, is helpful, but it's not going to solve it all. On Illinois, we are trying to get there, and we'll continue to work. In Illinois, um, obviously, this is where my heart is. Yes. Hi. Uh, my question is, when are we going to have the conversation that nobody wants to have? That we live in a society where the policies, educational and otherwise, are designed to empower some groups at the expense of others. When are we going to be able to have a panel that doesn't consist of white males in suits who have no children that are at risk? Every day I have to call and make sure my sons are getting home. This is every day. But the policies that are ultimately enacted, I don't have a say in any of those. So we've had failed policy after policy after policy. When is there going to be more inclusion? When, what, how can we believe that the policies are not designed to do exactly what they're doing, to create a permanent underclass? I think those are hugely important conversations to have and appreciate you having the courage to raise it. And the lack of diversity on this you know, stage here is, is uh, pretty self-evident and is part of the challenge in this debate. When I led to Chicago Public Schools, I actually sued the state of Illinois because I saw a system of funding inequity that perpetuated poverty and social failure. That our, our kids in Chicago had less than half the money spent on them each year than kids that happen to live five miles north of us um, along the lake. Think of that impact, the compounding impact of that lack of opportunity over 12 or 13 years. The kids who need the most get the least. We have 15,000 school districts in this country. That's supposed to be the fount of innovation and local control, and I get all that. I keep asking the question, 15,000 school districts. Find me one school district, one school district that systemically identifies their most successful, hardest working in teachers and principals and places them with the kids in the communities who need the most help. I can't find one. I can't find one. I keep looking. And in fact, all the incentives go the other way, to have the, wealthy, to have the more successful teachers get paid more to go to the wealthier suburbs, where, yes, those kids need a great education too, but they need it, I think, I would argue, we need more help on the south and west side of Chicago. So these are very, very important conversations to have. No easy answers. Um, but we have a system, not just in policies, but in terms of funding of education in this country, that perpetuates and exacerbates the haves and the have-nots. Just know that in my heart, everything I'm trying to do, not that I'm doing it perfectly, is to tackle that challenge. Another thing we haven't talked about today is technology. I think technology can do a lot to increase equity and to level the playing field. But I would argue raising standards, when we're talking about Common Core, no one, no one will benefit more than those who historically have had things dummy down for them. Right here. Yeah. Hi, thanks so much for coming. I'm Myra Quadra. I'm a second year at UChicago, and I'm a student of the Institute of Politics. Um, so much earlier in the conversation, Mr. Knowles brought up this idea of content specialists in the classroom and perhaps their importance. I'm interested to know what do Mr. Hess and Mr. Duncan think of this? Um, and furthermore, you said that they have been shown to get up to speed with trained educators. So what do you think should be done about the students who are affected by the years where those content specialists are not up to speed since teachers are not just content feeders? You want to start? Um, well, I mean, all the research suggests that every teacher takes time to get up to speed. Uh, teachers, I mean, if you're, I mean, it's, it partly depends what it means to get up to speed. If we're looking in terms of how we usually measure this, the only way anybody knows how to measure this, which is value-added reading scores and grades re in reading and math, uh, teachers tend to improve in their first three to five years and then plateau. Um, so that's the reality. Uh, I don't know of any high caliber research which, are, which makes the case that, uh, that, that those trajectories or the starting points are systematically different uh, for teachers who majored uh, in academic subjects or majored in education. Uh, there's lots of descriptive reasons to think that folks who major in education undergrad uh, are not as academically accomplished. 
Um, but there's also questions, particularly in K-6 education, um, about whether a content major undergrad is necessarily all that helpful. Um, so, you know, I mean, in, in general, I mean, partly, and then, then there goes, if we're talking about requiring folks to do an additional year of instruction, when we talk about residency models, uh, there's a whole bunch of added costs. Uh, and so all of these questions about the right way uh, to select teachers, to train teachers, to bring teachers in the field, uh, I think we tend to get very caught up in trying to find a flavor of the month model. And every five years, conventional thinking on this shifts. And I've been through about four or five cycles of this now since I entered the profession. And my own preference is less to worry about finding the right model and more about encouraging folks who find models that work for the teachers they're working with, for the students they're serving, and encourage those to grow and scale and expand. I totally agree with that point. I'm much, there is no one right model. I think we'll keep chasing that forever. I think we should have multiple providers, let the marketplace play, have a little competition, and those that are doing a great job should get more teachers going into classrooms, and those that are producing teachers that aren't benefiting students, you should hire less teachers coming out of those programs. Um, not everyone here will agree with this. I'm a fan of alternative certification. Um, where you have people who, physicists, mathematicians, people who know biology, chemistry, coming out of the private sector who want to help out. We desperately need people in the STEM fields to know contact, not just in junior and senior in high school, but in third and fourth and fifth grade, where, te where students start to lose interest because their teachers aren't comfortable in content. We need to bring them in. This is just one anecdote. I won't use his name, but I met with a, literally a world-renowned scientist who had this amazing career and actually wanted to go teach in the inner city, and in New York, and wanted to go back and help because of all the crazy alternative certification things, he couldn't get in, so he ended up at Princeton University. So he was good enough for Princeton, but wasn't good enough for the public schools, and his heart was with, was with those public school kids. Something's wrong with that picture. Yeah. Uh, so, hi, I'm Mason Gerard, and I'm a high school student, so, I've been watching this whole endeavor, and I'm watching the my me and my peers sort of positions being changed around here and there uh, by adults. And my question is, why is there not a major student voice in deciding educational policy? I think this is a much larger issue, and David Axelrod is the pro, and I'm not on this, but. Student voice, parent voice, I'm actually totally non-political. I could care less Republican, Democrat. If we want to have a stronger educational system in our country, I just wish a lot more young people, a lot more parents, a lot more communities, more people went to the voting booth asking what was that political leader at the state level or local level or national level, what are they going to do to improve educational opportunity? And I look at the massive waiting list for early childhood education around the country, that's unacceptable. I look at a 25% dropout rate, high school, that's unacceptable. I look at college graduation rates. We used to be first in the world, today we're 12th. Nowhere am I thinking, wow, we've really hit this out of the park. It's fascinating, if you watch the presidential debates, how much did education come up? Almost none, almost none. Why? Because it's eighth and ninth on people's list. So I'm biased, I think it should be one, two, and three. But if more people went to the voting booth where education is one, two, or three, again, across the political spectrum, I could care less. I promise you our country would be much stronger today, much less in inequity, much better, much more economically competitive than uh, where we are, where we are right now. Just a moderator's prerogative here. Um, it turns out Gates spent $300 million on trying to figure out who good teachers were. And the best predictor was students. They could tell you better than pretty much anything. We at the Urban Education Institute have a tool that is derived from student and teacher voice to determine the extent to which a school is organized well and organized for improvement. Highly predictive. So your point is not just important politically, but it's also important substantively. Students actually have a huge amount to, to add, and, and there's good research underpinnings to support that. David. So uh, it falls to me to, I see all these hands, and I'm sure we could uh, continue this discussion for many, many hours, uh, and it, as, as it deserves. Uh, we have another panel coming, however, so I'm going to close down this part of the discussion uh, with uh, a, a question that builds on what I said when we uh, began. I think everyone in this room would agree uh, on the importance of education. That's why uh, they're here. I think everyone would agree 
that uh, the level of education you get says a lot about your ability to move uh, economically, socially, and so on. Everybody would agree that our country's future uh, and the quality of it uh, rests in part on an educated workforce relative to com competition around the world. So my question really, is, I, I would like to start with, with uh, Rick on uh, the, uh, what, what, given all of that and given the stakes and given the equity, we all have an equal, a social, uh, uh, you know, equality of opportunity in this country. What should the proper role of the federal government uh, be to help promote those goals? Sure, no, that's a great question. Um, and one, let me preface it, you know, the Secretary has made the point a couple times that post NCLB, 19 or 20 states, arguably even more, um, as he said, dummy down their standards. But that's not quite right, I would argue. Um, what those states didn't actually do was modify the standards, their equivalent of the Common Core, the words on the page. What they did was they played around with testing cut scores. They played around with the number of answers kids needed to get right in order to score well. So I would argue that when the Secretary talks about high standards, that we're actually conflating two things. We're conflating the words on the page that describe what it is kids are hypothetically supposed to know and how it is that we actually hold our own feet to the fire when it comes to judging whether or not students are learning more and going the right direction. And frankly, as I, as I think you know, Mr. Secretary, Paul Peterson and I in Education Next, starting back about 2006, were the very first folks to actually write about what we called uh, the truth and advertising gap between what NAEP was reflecting and what states were self-reporting. So I have a lot of sympathy, but I think this points to a problem that there is an enormous amount of opportunity for games playing when it comes to education policy. And the last thing we need is more game playing or more folk, well-meaning folks at the US Department of Education trying to write rules for state education agencies, then writing rules for local education agencies, then writing rules for what schools are supposed to do, because what happens out of this game of telephone is we wind up with new rules and restrictions. So what's the right federal role? For me, it's always been about four things. One, I believe there's an enormous federal role when it comes to transparency. Uh, this is why I am so supportive of the idea of commonality and assessment. I think it is good and important that parents be able to get information on how their kids are doing, how their state compares, how their district compares, and that we can break those out for subpopulations and for individual kids. Uh, second, I think there's a key federal role when it comes to supporting research. Um, this, is a, this is a public good, and if the uh, federal government is not supporting, it's not going to get supported. Uh, third, there is a need for a trust-busting role. Quite frankly, uh, folks in a community can elect a school board that wants to do some of the things the Secretary talked about, assign teachers differently, hire differently, evaluate differently, but oftentimes their hands are tied by greenfield provisions and contracts of which they have no way to get out from under. And so I think there's an enormous opportunity for the federal government to create the machinery where states and districts can make sure they're, that they're not locked in by the dead hand of the past. And fourth and finally, I think there's a critical federal role in offering support to folks who are trying to solve problems in new ways and try to get legitimacy. Um, a great example of this is the American Board for the Certification of Teacher Excellence, which offers an alternative uh, to going through a traditional teacher preparation program. Uh, what they did a number of years ago with federal support, they created a series of exams to test uh, existing teacher knowledge. And if teachers passed in terms of professional knowledge, in terms of content knowledge, they could then apply for jobs and districts could make the decision of whether or not they would be good employees for kids. Um, to me, those are the four key federal roles. As we get beyond that, as I worry we do too often, I think we wind up with new levels of regulation and bureaucracy and compliance. And I don't think it's good for kids and I don't think it's good for teachers, not because the intentions aren't good, but because of our system of government and because of the kind of country we live in. I think the most important federal role Rick didn't mention is to support the most vulnerable children. So the vast majority of our money goes to help poor children, uh, children with special needs. That's a lion's share of our budget. Uh, we spend a huge amount of money each year, $150 billion, to help people go to college. Um, we want to do more in the early childhood space, haven't done enough there. So trying to increase social mobility, which is a huge uh, challenge in this country, trying to increase educational opportunity for those that have been locked out for far too long. Um, you know, when you, interrupt, when you try to integrate Little Rock High School in Arkansas, you had the federal government there. There was a, there was a reason why. It wasn't, wasn't happening. 
And so that historical role is one that I take very seriously. Um, I agree with everything Rick said to be clear, so I don't take away from any of those four, but I just think it goes beyond that. So that's, that would be absolutely the top of my list. Um, part of what we talked about, building communities of practice, sharing best practices, working on that, um, giving folks the opportunity to do the right thing, to create the political space and funding opportunities to challenge the status quo and do something very different, to have the courage. I think, again, not just resources, but bully pulpit have given people room to move they didn't normally have. And the final thing I'd close where I started, the reverse of No Child Left Behind, I think we absolutely have to have a high bar for our, all children, but again, particularly to protect the most disadvantaged, but they have a lot more flexibility, less federal bureaucracy, let states and local communities tell us how they're going to educate their children, and let's share what is working in those different situations. Well, I want to just thank both of you for being here. Uh, as I said, this is an enormously important issue, and you guys are both passionate uh, advocates, and I think we've been... Uh, We've been uh, uh, well served by, by you both being here today. And Secretary, thank you for your service. Thank you all for, uh, for coming. I think we're going to try. If, if, you're, uh, if you have to, uh, to skip out, that's totally fine. But uh, for those of you who are still here, we're going to move forward with uh, our panel on the implementation of the Common Core state standards um, and we promise to be getting you home uh, to getting you home by dinner. Um, my name is Darren Reesberg. I'm the executive director at the Institute of Politics here at the University of Chicago and you've now heard from Secretary Duncan about the Common Core state standards and why the U.S. Department of Education supports their adoption and implementation by the states as well as a voice from the federal education policy community critical of the standards and their prospects for actually uh, effectively uh, affecting public education. So we now want to talk about where the rubber meets the road. Uh, we want to talk about implementation in our states. Are the Common Core standards a good thing for the state of Illinois, for our school districts, for our teachers, for our students? And to participate in this panel, I'd like to introduce the following. Um, all the way to my left. Dan Montgomery is the President and Chief Operating Officer of the Illinois Federation of Teachers, which is a 103,000 member union representing educators across the state. Prior to assuming this role, Dan taught English for 18 years at Niles North High School in Skokie, Illinois, where for 10 of those years he served as the President of the 1,700 member local union. Among Dan's many other honors at Niles, he was dubbed, quote, favorite and most amazing teacher ever by Katie Rossman, who's on our staff here at the Institute of Politics. Um, Dan is uh, currently an elected vice president uh, of the American Federation of Teachers and served on the AFT's ad hoc committee on the Common Core State Standards. Uh, in the middle is Dr. Jose Torres. Dr. Torres has served as superintendent of school district U46 in Elgin, Illinois since 2008. U46 uh, is the second largest school district in Illinois, uh, serving 40,000 Illinois students across 40 elementary schools, eight middle schools, and five high schools. Based on 2012 district demographic data, 50% of the students in U46 are Hispanic, 32% white, 7% black. In the face of economic challenges, Dr. Torres has created and implement, implemented Destination 2015, which is a comprehensive five-year accountability uh, plan designed to ensure the district's success. And prior to 2008, Dr. Torres served in Chicago public schools and many other districts nationwide. Uh, and to my immediate left is Robin Staines. Robin currently serves as Executive Director of Advance Illinois, an independent statewide education policy and advocacy organization. Uh, Ms. Staines has spent the last 13 years working on public school reform. She served as the Issues Director of the Small Schools Coalition and as Associate Director of Leadership for quality education. Prior to her work in school reform, and I'll call you Robin now, not Miss Staines, because that sounds weird. Uh, Robin taught at public high schools in Boston, San Francisco, and Chicago. Uh, Robin is a parent of three CPS students and formerly served on one of the Chicago public schools local school councils. So uh, very quickly, before I ask our panelists about implementation of the Common Core Standards here in Illinois, I'm going to put on my prior hat uh, when I served at the uh, Illinois State Board of Education and give uh, you here and particularly our students, some of whom uh, hail from states other than Illinois and countries other than the United States, just a very quick primer uh, of the Illinois education system. Uh, we have in Illinois 
uh, 867 school districts. Uh, 867 school districts, so that, that's a problem. Um, and unlike <laughs> states such as uh, Florida, uh, where they have county-based school systems, uh, it makes it far more difficult for Illinois to manage that number of districts in a fragmented uh, mess. Uh, we have 4,272 public schools, 1,468 private, about 2.3 million students, 2 million public, 300,000 private, 151,000 public school personnel, 21,000 private. Uh, you heard Secretary Duncan talk about states adopting the Common Core Standards. Uh, Illinois was one of those 46 states. We did that uh, when I was there in 2010. And in the adoption of, of the standards in Illinois, uh, it's actually a required administrative process where you do have public hearings um, and they uh, go through uh, a, a subset of the Illinois legislature um, before they go into law. And they are now law here in Illinois since 2010 and are required to be implemented uh, by all of our 867 school districts. And that's in English language arts and uh, math. And at around that same time, Illinois became part of the Partnership for the Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers, which is otherwise known as PARC. Um, and that's where the assessment piece comes in. PARC is a consortium of 26 states that have adopted the Common Core Standard and are pooling their resources to create benchmarked assessment systems aligned to the Common Core. These assessments essentially will replace the Illinois Standards Achievement Test, ISAT, which is given in grades three through eight, and the Prairie State Achievement Test, which is given in grade 11, and that's supposed to happen um, in the 2014-2015 school year. So uh, with that background, Dan, I'm gonna turn to you first. And you taught uh, high school for 18 years, and you now lead a state teachers union of over 100,000 members. So very simple, uh, are the Common Core state standards a good thing for teachers and students here in Illinois? Are they a bad thing, or are they just meh? <laughs> and, um, and, and I'd like when you answer that to distinguish between the standards themselves uh, and the assessments that um, are tied in many ways to those standards. Well, that's a very important distinction. So first let me say that the, um, the U of C's gain is the state board's loss. Darren did a great job when he was at the State Board of Education. And um, <clears throat> I'm glad he's here doing this work as well. And, um, and uh, you were also very wise to hire Katie Rossman. So <laughs> just put that out there, former student of mine. Um, you know, I, I think, is it a good thing? It's, it's a good thing that this is called the Institute of Politics. <laughs> because um, who you ask about that may depend on their understanding of and their belief, their political beliefs about this issue, as I think you kind of saw some of that in the first panel. Um, you know, we did a survey of IFT members in March of this year, and there were, we had 4,000, mostly teachers, but 4,000 IFT members respond to the survey, which was really, we'd never had that many uh, hits on something. And it was about the Common Core and their readiness in the Common Core. And, um, you know, the vast majority of them, 80%, uh, were aware of it, um, and, and, um, but only 14% of the respondents said they felt that they were really expert on the Common Core. Not even, I'm ready to teach it tomorrow. It's like, I'm expert and I'm aware fully of what it all means. Um, and you know, over 50% of the people said they were sort of emerging. So um, there's, there's a, a huge gap between you know, having standards and saying, this is what we need to have uh, children learn and be able to do. And, and then on the ground, what's gonna happen in schools to see that that happens. Now, I have to say, um, there has, in the teaching profession, <laughs> I think looking back, many teachers and professionals would say, we're coming out of a very dark period for our profession. A period where teachers felt fully under attack for all, virtually all the ills of society. Um, and, and teachers felt that uh, massive changes in teacher evaluation, for instance, and assessments and many other things, I could rattle them off almost ad nauseum, the changes that we've uh, been subject to in our profession. So that atmosphere, has created one where I would think that there is a, a lot of skepticism, more than you would otherwise expect for, for Common Core standards. And to illustrate that, let me say, if you go back 35, 40 years to the leadership of Al Shanker in my union, the American Federation of Teachers, Al Shanker was a national figure saying, we need national standards, we need standards, we need better standards. And it was, it, it was controversial with people like Rick Hess who said, well, we don't like this idea of national standards, but it wasn't controversial among, among the teaching profession 
who said, yeah, that, that's true, we do. The civil rights community was absolutely with us. Why should a child learning algebra in eighth grade in Lake Forest, Illinois, whose family moves to, oh, I don't know, Texas, uh, not get algebra? Or get a, worse even still, a different algebra, right? Um, or kids anywhere around the country you can say that argument for. So it was seen as a civil rights issue. Now there are some among the teaching profession who are very skeptical of the Common Core. I see that as collateral damage, if you will, of sort of the testing regime that we've been under, which uh, we feel, I feel, is, is changing. So that said, to your next point about assessment, you know, our union called for Randy Weingarten, the national president of the AFT, which we're affiliated with, and Chicago teachers are affiliated with, said we should have a moratorium on the high stakes use of uh, the Common Core and the assessments related to them. Now, I think it's important. We're not saying put a moratorium on the whole thing. We're not saying we shouldn't have standards. We, we do believe we should have standards, and we believe in the Common Core, uh, and that they are better standards. And I can say, as an English teacher, having worked under the old Illinois standards, they were useless at best. Uh, as an English teacher, I mean, any lesson I had could hit have hit probably every standard there was. Uh, and I've seen the standards now, the Common Core standards, and. I've can speak best about the English ones, but they are much better. They are much better. So, um, but uh, what we have said is the high stakes use of testing coming out of those standards, uh, we should just put a, a moratorium on until we're further along. And that's because the progression should be, and it really should be, you know, anyone here involved in education, more than just having been a student should know this, you begin with standards, you move to writing curriculum and curricular materials, and then you move to assessments. And, and so, uh, Dan, I want to uh, actually uh, move from that point uh, and, you know, in terms of, of this potential moratorium and hear from Robin as well as Dr. Torres on their thoughts with respect to a moratorium. We have, in addition to uh, Randy Weingarten's call for a moratorium, we have some uh, legislation. It's not, probably not fair to call it legislation, a resolution by a representative of the House here in Illinois that seeks a moratorium on the uh, implementation of the Common Core in its entirety for various reasons. So um, we can get to that uh, as well, but Robin, um, I'd love to hear your take on the moratorium concept. On the moratorium, um, in many ways we actually have that in Illinois because the way Illinois has, so we've already adopted the Common Core, we did that in 2010, and so those standards are now out there. You've got people, in fact, working on curriculum, professional development. I'm sure we'll talk more about some of the implementation challenges, so I'll, I'll hold off on that. But the way, um, high stakes attached to teacher evaluation around assessments. So, and, and, I'm sorry, let me stagger it. New assessments are set to roll out in Illinois in 2014, 2015. So not this school year, but another school year. So now you've got several years um, of having the standards and curricular work before the new assessments come. And then the way Illinois has structured the implementation of any um, high stakes being attached via teacher evaluations is those won't really um, hit the majority of the state until the 2016, 2017 school year. So in fact, that discussion is more of a discussion for other states that are on different timelines. We're actually on a, I think, a pretty, a pretty reasonable, pretty methodical um, timeline here in Illinois. Well, and Dr. Torres, any thoughts so there? So I would say that the, you have to question the assumption. So the assumption is that you have to test every child in every school every year. and. Um, so from my perspective, that is best le left at the local district. Uh, just ensure that, hey, you know, we'll assess, we'll, we'll ensure that there are robust evaluations and we have some in, in U46, and let's adopt a more like a NAEP assessment, National as uh, uh, Assessment of Education Progress, the nation's report card, random assessments, few kids, takes off that whole idea of how many um, how much technology you really need to have in every school um, to ensure that every single student has access to every single uh, technology. And so you, you move that, or if, if, you were, if we were able to move the conversation about teacher evaluation out, outside of the Common Core assessments, we would have uh, more time to think about some more difficult challenges like ensuring that everybody has early childhood or ensuring that kids are fed or those kinds of things. And so, uh, you know, I think Rick Hess had mentioned this, this issue, a concern of his, that you had a, a couple of different 
uh, reform movements that were sort of moving along the same path. And I know, Robin, you're talking about the fact that in Illinois, there's a bit of a nuance in that our teacher evaluation system isn't implemented immediately in most districts and actually has somewhat of a delayed implementation process. But the fact of the matter is that we here in Illinois, as Dan said, have gone through a number of major educational reforms, especially affecting teachers over the past few years. Um, and so, you know, with that as the background, I do want to talk about the general implementation issues we have in a state with 867 school districts. Did I say that? Um, 867 school districts. So, um, you know, we, uh, we have, uh, you know, Advance, uh, Advance Illinois is part of this Common Core coalition, and it's a very diverse group that's looking to implement the Common Core with fidelity here in Illinois. And so that is Chicago Public Schools, the Chicago Teachers Union, the IFT, the PTA, the Business Roundtable. Um, so you have, I think, a coalescence of a number of these important diverse groups that are looking to do this right. But in a state with 867 school districts, 4,200 public schools, what are the strategies to really see effective, consistent implementation of standards across the state? I'm wondering if there's a drinking game where every time it's 867 <laughs> districts, somebody's got to take right. a shot. Uh, I have children sure. in college, right? I have a daughter in college, so I, it comes too, too quickly to mind. Um, it, is, it is, the truth is, it is a huge challenge to try and implement with fidelity. And just to give you a sense of how tough, tough that is, the last time Illinois made a shift in its standards, uh, and there were even more districts. I think there were like 890 at that time. Um, they did a survey, there was a follow-up uh, bit of research on how many districts had in fact really truly implemented those standards, and I think that was about five, six years into it. And it was something like 27, 30% of districts had really fully implemented. So this is not an easy thing to do across a lot of districts, particularly because a lot of those districts are very, very small. I mean, I don't know if people are aware, but about half of those 867 districts, for those of you who are playing at home, um, about half of them are under 1,000 kids, under fully a quarter to a third of them are under 500 kids. So these are very small, which means there's not a lot of back office support um, to, to support change when it comes. So there's no question that you are gonna need a few things to happen. One, local leadership is gonna matter enormously. It's having local leaders who know who are able to tap into resources, you heard uh, I think it was Rick Hess say, and he's probably not far off, that if you type in Common Core English Language Arts Curriculum, you'll get tens of thousands of hits with very little idea of which of those are better or worse. And so there's a lot, I think it's incumbent upon on, uh, outside organizations, but also state bodies, state agencies, to do a better job vetting and how can they sort of lift to the top and say, first of all, nobody has time to read all of that. We're, you know, you've got busy teachers, busy administrators. Um, but second of all, even if they did, it's very tough to parse that off from scratch. So one, better mechanism for um, identifying good quality resources. Two, local leaders, the districts that are moving ahead and are doing a good job have a few things in common. One, they're doing a good job of bringing in teachers and actually giving them the time they need to plan. And time is just always in scarce supply. And so figuring creative ways to actually make that happen is, is gonna require collaboration between uh, teachers and administrators and a lot of real vision and local leadership um, at the district and the school level. Um, and then finally, there is, well, two other things. One, very consistent communications to, again, across 867 districts. What can we do to make good information available that's, that can be used consistently um, by principals and by teachers to communicate with families who are also have a lot of questions and are deeply affected by this? And then lastly, there's just a broader investment issue in the, in the state. Common Core, in many ways, is a, is a, is a revenue-neutral issue. I mean, we, we have standards now. These will be new standards. But the reality is, any time you make a transition this big, um, and the bigger you think it is, the more you, there's got to be an investment that goes along with that. There are all sorts, the, the development, the resources, the support. And at the same time that we've been um, calling for the implementation of Common Core, we have cut inflation-adjusted $1.4 billion from the education budget. I mean, keep in mind, by the way, that the overall education budget is only 6.7 billion. So you pull 1.4 billion right when you're trying to do important stuff, that is just a recipe for things not to go the way we all need them to go. So the more you believe that this is something that really can and should help all of our students, and frankly has been very much welcomed, um, you know, teachers who are teaching this, like you've got fewer things to teach in math, so you really can take the time. So we've got a lot of work to do on the school funding front, and so you're gonna be certainly hearing more from us, and I, I think from the state, and there's some work underway right now at the state level. So uh, that's it's a, a very good point, Robin, and I want actually to ask Dr. Torres about that. So, you know, as we discussed, you're the second largest of our school districts here in Illinois with 40,000 students, and I'm interested in uh, how your uh, 
instruction you know, uh, in your, your 50 or so schools has changed, how you have seen it change, if at all, from the time that you came into the district, which was before the Common Core was adopted in 2008, uh, to now. And you know, we have many school districts, I think you know this, um, in uh, Illinois, who uh, really aren't dependent in any way on state funds, right? I mean, you know, this is uh, uh, more of the, the large majority of their dollars are coming from property taxes. Um, we're almost last in the country here in Illinois in terms of the percentage of dollars that come, education dollars in the state that are coming from the state versus local and federal sources. So um, I'm interested in how things have changed, but I'm also interested in whether or not a change or lack thereof in U46 is affected by the fact that your district, which is one of those districts that does rely in large part on general state aid, and we had some discussions about that back in our day, um, you know, whether that actually affects implementation in your district, and if so, how? Well, uh, yes, thank you for your support during the uh, days when we were battling uh, Springfield. And I want to thank everybody who's here and uh, for coming out. And I see some friends from Englewood. I was an area superintendent just a few blocks from here. Um, and it's a different world just a few blocks from here. Um, and children are literally dying. Children don't eat at home, don't have resources. And so when you tell teachers, I want you to change your practice, they're looking at you and they're saying, really? This is, you know, how are you going to support me? And so when I started in 08, um, I came in with a strong desire to be an instructional leadership superintendent. And that was sort of my uh, identification, my own identity. And when I arrived in October of 08, we had a major catastrophe in terms of uh, funds. And so in 09, I was giving 1,000 reduction in force notices to 5,000 FTE, 5,000 employees. So 20% of my workforce, we went to 25 and 30 students, 29 kindergarten kids and first grade kids are a challenge, by the way, <laughs> uh, if you haven't been in one of those classrooms. And so we have seen instruction get worse before it got better. And one of the challenges that we posed was, we, we said, and, and, and I said since I've arrived in, in Illinois, was that exceeds is the new meat. And so meat standards were way too low. And so we were always trying to push the envelope and push how do we push writing especially and provide feedback to students. Because that's really, if we only taught um, writing, especially nonfiction writing to our students and reading, we would be very far down the road because that, I don't know about you, but that's primarily what I read on a daily basis and primarily what I write on a daily basis. So over the last probably two years, we have seen, seen a, a shift to really trying to unpack these uh, common core standards. And what I've seen is finally we've begun to see some more writing, some more uh, desire from teachers to say, okay, if you want me to teach nonfiction reading, where are the books? Uh, we've been pushing a lot of classroom libraries, but most of the focus has been on, on, on fiction. And so we've got to figure that out. And then as you've said about our district, we are uh, not only 50% Hispanic, but we have a strong commitment to dual language education. So teaching in English and teaching in Spanish. And the challenge for, for me as a superintendent is that, yes, I want to support Common Core, but that's common, it, the assumption is common core in English. And then, so we want to in, ensure that students are dual, uh, bilingual, biliterate, bicultural. And so if I'm teaching my first, second, and third grade students mostly in Spanish, I'd like to assess them in Spanish and show that they have learned. And I'm not just talking about Spanish-speaking students, I'm talking about English-speaking students. And I think th that challenge is the challenge that, that uh, becomes much more uh, difficult to meet when assessments are coming and, and all of the sort of various goals that are, are, are presented to us as superintendents. Can I have sure. a one? Because I think that is a hugely important issue. And um, I'm curious in your take on that, one of the things that there's a potential um, good news. The park assessment will be shared by a whole number of states, and then there's, this, there's another assessment being developed called the Smarter Balanced, which sounds like a bread spread, right? I'm thinking butter spread, um, that are being developed. But there's been discussion at the front end about having a consistent strategy. I mean, right now, every state's got its own exams. It's got its own benchmarks. It's got its own way of handling accommodations, including for bilingual students. 
And so here you've got a much broader set of people talking about this and a much, there's an opportunity, I think, to, re, to, to actually you know, make more, not just baby steps improvements in how we handle that issue, but actually much more significant and, and broad, far-reaching ones. Dan, I just want to uh, pick up on these points mm -hmm. uh, in a couple of ways. One, this point about English language learners, um, I'd be interested in, in your take. It's a criticism that doesn't get much publicity about the Common Core standards that the language supports well, aren't necessarily there to support that, the content right. standards. And in, the, in the park exam that, that Illinois has signed up to do, I mean, that is a computer-based exam where, where students are going to have to sit at computers and do this exam. And we know there are thousands of places, schools in Illinois, where that's going to be a serious challenge from an infrastructure or capital viewpoint, whether there are those computers to do that. That directly relates to whether um, you know, the paper and pencil tests are going to be in any way comparable to what's going to happen online or in the computer-based uh, test. So I don't, a lot of us are very uncomfortable, me included, about not only the English language learner aspect of that exam, but, um, but the other sort of rolling out the, the logistics of doing it. Um, and this is all to say, I think, in the supports, our argument that putting a moratorium on the high stakes consequences is not an unreasonable thing to do if what you want to do is have really good standards, have really great curriculum built around them that the teachers understand and can deliver well, and then you come up with reasonable assessments that are not uh, intrusive. Um, you know, sort of early, um, some early returns about how much time the park exam would take out of instruction are disturbing, I think, <laughs> to a lot of us. Um, so, so there's, so for, for my way of thinking, this is uh, an argument for, I mean, 2014, 15 is not years ahead, it's next school year. And, um, and so to sort of say, look, let's make sure we get the implementation of this correct before we go, and then, because you know what will happen, once the assessments come out, there'll be a chorus of people from all sorts of political stripes saying, look, lo and behold, this district is failing, or that, that, that city's schools aren't you know, doing well, and, and we, we shouldn't have to go there. And I want to say two other things just about the implementation. Um, I don't know how many people really know how uh, curriculum is developed is written. I mean, I think a lot of people think, well, you know, you, you send out to Pearson or Glenview Publishing or whatever, they send you books and a curriculum, right? Well, that is not curriculum. Textbooks are not curriculum. And um, what, what happens is, in, in the best scenarios, is you have thoughtful uh, leaders <laughs> like the superintendent here who says, you know, let's, we have to do this right. You have often existing committees within the district and teachers and administrators uh, in subject areas of which their experts get together with their boards of education who give them guidance about what they want their curriculum to do in their locality. And then they write these things. And I have written many in my career, and I've revised many in my career, as any teacher has, most likely. Uh, and it takes time. It is difficult to do well, uh, as it should be. And it's you know heavy intellectual exercise. And um, so the idea of time as a resource cannot be, I think, overemphasized. You know, when the secretary was here, I would, I would beg to differ with him. He said that Title II money was you know, going towards professional development. Well, that money is already dedicated. That money is, by law, already out there for mostly given you know, based on poverty. Um, $750 million the department spent on assessments, but uh, zero on professional development. And, and if you went district by district in Illinois, uh, and I don't fault the school boards for this, mostly because we're in this terrible time that Robin talked about of starvation of resources, but uh, the amount that school districts devote to professional development, which means it's not sending teachers on you know, vacation, it's sitting down and having time that we can work on curriculum. It's very minimal. And so one, one uh, question that um, is selfish given my prior role, but uh, I have no illusions that right now the State Board of Education is not providing those resources, those supports, the professional development in order for you uh, both as leaders, um, as advocates, and as teachers to be able to do well, what you want to be doing. And I just want to point out, it's because it's, it's something that I think is, is missing from the, the conversation, is that when I got there in 2005, um, we had been cut down to about 450 people <laughs> yeah. from 1,000 people at the beginning of 2000. Right. Um, and you know, there's really not the bandwidth to be able to, to do that. Um, and so I'm just wondering you know, whether you feel like 
with additional resources, a state agency could actually be effective in trying to establish consistency and provide resources? Is that not necessary? And if it's not necessary, then where are you really looking in order to develop okay. uh, you know, this? Yeah. this uh, I would say it, it's necessary, but not sufficient. And, um, and they should have those resources. Uh, and you're absolutely right. The state board has been decimated, and, and their abilities to help local school districts you know, follows that. Um, um, you know, we're doing a couple of things. I mean, obviously, it has to happen, right? People know, they see these timelines coming. It has to happen. Uh, teachers are people that like to, you know, see the problem that, you know, how do we attack this and get it done? Um, a couple of things we've done in Chicago, the Quest Center, which is a professional issue center in Chicago, working with the AFT, got an innovation fund grant. And they have a bunch of people, including, a, you know, full-time staff who uh, are working with taking great lessons, having, having, having teachers create creative, innovative, thoughtful, terrific lessons along the Common Core, uh, and then disseminating, disseminating them to their colleagues and, and being a resource. Um, Quincy, Illinois, um, we've got uh, another innovation fund grant there where the goal of what they're doing in Quincy is really to engage parents. So parents know, what does your third grader, what, what are they going to be learning in math in third grade? What should you expect the school is doing? And uh, so it's not a big mystery to them. And um, those are kinds of things that we can do. We can all do in our organizations to help, you know, here and there. But, um, you know, there are some of us, uh, me included, who have advocated for examples, national examples, not national curriculum, not, uh, not uh, some, you know, something from the federal government even. but. Uh, you know, exemplars that we can all look at for, you know, we shouldn't all have to reinvent, you know, 857 wheels in Illinois. And there's no question that the state agency, when, when people want to know about Common Core, the first place they go, you guys have a website, you guys, it's not you anymore, um, you guys, whoever's out there from ISBE, have a website on the Common Core, and it tends to be one of the first places. When I talk to teachers, and I'm sure you guys hear the same, it's the first place people go, and honestly, just one or two people would be would give them a huge leg up in their ability to, 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 to find those national exemplars. It would be a place that people would turn to that would have some gravitas where they could start to sift through those 30,000 hits and say, no, here are the ones that you want to start with. And there may be other places you go, but. So with, I, I think with, the website breaks down after 5,000 hits. It, 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 well, let's, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe you need a third person to expand that. But, um, and actually, there's been some efforts, I believe, um, at the state agency to try and bring in some outside support to do that. But because there is, there's just an, there's a role that they uniquely can play, though certainly it's That's not sufficient. Right. I mean, I, I think the state has to differentiate, right? Because, uh, frankly, right. when I get things from the state, you know, I have other work that I'm trying to do <laughs> that is more important than read the state stuff. Um, so what we have done is we have really made a commitment to not purchase the stuff that has common core st uh, stickers on it. We have, because we came from a system where if we said we want to do writing, someone went and got a writing curriculum. We wanted to teach phonics, someone got a phonics program. And so we have realized that what we want to do is really build on the professional capacity of our teachers. And so rather than buying stuff, we're buying time, actually. And we brought uh, uh, school improvement teams together because the principal is not the only instructional leader in that building. And so we wanted to kind of bring that person with additional teachers in that building and together, they're, they're unpacking, they're developing lessons that they can bring back to their schools. And what we actually do, did is actually buy time. And so, and, and just do it little by little. And if we can get part, you know, these six standards implemented this year, that's our goal. Next year, we'll do a little bit more. And the other question is, how do you get more of that happening? So there are some districts that are doing some phenomenal jobs. And, and, and again, the common denominator is time, that they really are finding creative ways. But you don't want 867 districts having to figure that out. Wouldn't it be great if more people sort of had heard about yeah, um, and the other Schomburg challenge, and Elgin yeah. and a couple of other places? Well, the other challenge about time is that I want my teachers in the classroom during the year. And that's what they want to do, too. And so otherwise, you know, part of the professional development expense is the substitute that has to be in there that is substituting for the real teacher. And it's not the It's not the real thing, right? It's a substitute. Yeah. And I always get in trouble when I substitute tell me, oh, you guys. But it's true, it's the substitute for the teacher. And so we have to bring the teachers out and, and provide opportunities. So you, know, it, you can do that sometimes in the afternoon but, uh, and on weekends and in the summer, but eventually you do have to 
you know, pace it in a way that you're not taking them out all of the time because why develop all this great stuff when there's nobody, no real thing, person doing uh, there to provide the instruction? Yeah. Well, on yeah. that point, you know, I, I can't fail to mention that American teachers spend more time teaching than teachers in any other country. Sure. Um, we, and soon the PISA results will come out in early December and we'll have all these comparisons to, you know, American education to international education. Everybody must remember that in every one of those other countries that may score ahead of us, their teachers are spending far less time in the classroom. And what they're doing with the rest of their time is that. So no superintendent in Japan has to say, you know, it's loss of instructional time when our teachers are helping write curriculum because the days are designed and they have the resources to employ the right number of teachers so that it's a, uh, a whole, you know, a much more sane approach to it. I would also want to mention one other thing too. The AFT has got a Share My Lesson program may, people may have heard about. Um, we partnered with TLS in, in England and it's really taken off. I mean, there are lessons there that have had 26,000 shares where a discrete lesson, teachers can post lessons. Um, I've seen a lot of these as a teacher over the years of you know, lesson sharing websites and most of them I found to be pretty lousy but this one is really extraordinary and it's all stuff for teachers and it's aligned with a common core so you can kind of help find the right lessons for the right things. So we have to have those kinds of things but we need more supports from states and districts. And so um, I told you I'd get you home uh, by dinner uh, <laughs> but uh, so we're going to line people up for some questions but before I do that I think uh, Tim Knowles had mentioned that you know it would be we'd be remiss to not have a discussion about politics at the Institute of Politics as it relates to even the Common Thanks, Core Tim. State Standards implementation in Illinois. And so um, there is a resolution that's still existing, you know, in that uh, Illinois House. And this was a resolution that had been filed by uh, Representative Dwight Kay, who's from the Edwardsville area. Um, and he was at that point making a move for uh, House Minority Leader, um, which, uh, you know, wasn't ultimately sex successful. But 11 other House Republicans have signed on. And this seeks a delay of the entirety of the Common Core uh, implementation of the standards as well as any of the assessments. A couple of the points that uh, Representative Kay cites is a pioneer study which says that the implementation of the Common Core will cost Illinois 773 million over seven years. Um, so uh, somehow he has um, the ability to get pretty precise on that, uh, or the Pioneer Institute does. Um, and then that uh, many school districts lack the technology, infrastructure, and funding to create an environment for the online standards testing required by PARC or new textbooks required to teach the Common Core. But the you know, uh, environment, the technology, infrastructure, et cetera, I think is, is a legitimate point, um, knowing what that was like in some of our school districts here in the state. So I'm just interested um, in, uh, Robin, maybe uh, first you, and, and um, it may be the last word. I know you like to get that. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, in um, what your... Uh, what you say that affectionately, I of know. Of course, of course. What, what your uh, thinking is on the viability of a resolution like this, uh, whether this has any legs here in Illinois, um, whether it's just noise, uh, and anything else related to the politics right now. Uh, two quick front. points on that, uh, since you're trying to wrap. I, I, don't think, I, I don't think there's much chance that that's actually going to um, go anywhere. I, there are areas in the state that I think, particularly from the Tea Party, as you've heard, um, I mean, I've heard everything from the Common Core is a, I, I won't even repeat some of the things. I mean, just really very out there and not terribly informed. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't some legitimate issues. And the one that you pulled out, I think, is one that, that this, the, um, the hope and the expectation is that in moving to the new park assessments, which are designed to do a better job of moving beyond just content to more skills orientation, that one of the things that you do is you move to an online test, which allows you, by the way, one of the big benefits is that you get immediate turnaround time. I mean, right now we take a test and then, you know, you don't get it until you're in an entirely different grade with an entirely different teacher, you, you've moved on. And so to be able to get real time feedback is something we ought to want. More importantly, if you get technology in the buildings, that's something we want anyway, right? I mean, there's just, huge educational upside. So you could look at that and say, well, that's a reason to sort of, you know, delay or this. Or you could look at it and say, that is a great excuse and opportunity to deal with something we ought to have dealt with a long, long time ago. I mean, the fact that you have schools that don't have broadband access, the fact that you've got places where, you know, you've got one computer for 30 kids. I mean, we ought to have been working to move past that anyway. So I look at this as this is a great excuse and opportunity for the state to try and pull itself together, prioritize that, and move on it. Um, you know, and there will be paper and pencil versions. You know, absolutely, when they come out, people are going to have to look to see. But the, you know, certainly the the expectation is that people are going to be watching to see the the uh, comparability there. Sure. And Dan or Jose, any last 
So you said seven hundred and seventy-three million dollars and forty-six cents or whatever. <laughs> right. Um, so I have really a much better use for that. You know, one would be you know early childhood. Another one would be mentoring new teachers. Another one would be um, small, not necessarily smaller class sizes, but in the more individualized uh, instruction. And so I mean, the the question. Because of the challenge that we had in, in, U, in Nalgene U46 with regard to funding, I've always looked at how do we best use the fund? Is this the best return on the money for that amount of money? It's not, it doesn't mean that we have $773 million for assessments, is that we actually have that much money available, so how could we best use that fund? And so I can think of a, a bunch of other things, uses that I could use I, for that. I'm not sure that's really the right estimate, though. So <laughs> well, we Ford do, we want to be a little careful just have Dan, Dan <laughs> last yeah, well, word before we Fordham open the floor. Fordham has an estimate. Fordham did an estimate nationwide of $12 billion, so I don't know that that's necessarily off the mark. Um, and I would second your comments about using that money. However, I would say, I don't think it's an all or nothing proposition. I think we can and we should have good standards um, but we've got to do things the right way. And I'm hopeful and I feel like the tide is turning in this country that the sort of overreaching, galloping, crazed assessment uh, regime we've been living under is being pulled back uh, reasonably to be a, a much more reasonable sort of things we can live with and, and standards I, I think is a good thing to work on, but we shouldn't implement them and, and the stakes of them before they're fully uh, realized in classrooms. Well, it's a great segue to the questions. Uh, so please raise your hand and Jan Costner on our team will come and find you. Um, thank you, I'm Yayan Chong, PhD candidate in physics. Um, I want to ask a question about uh, curriculum building. Uh, despite current legislation that Secretary Duncan mentioned, do you think the federal government should be involved in curriculum building? And what level of locality do you think is the most e effective level to build a curriculum? And should geographical locations be an effective factor at all in curriculum building and implementation? Thank you. That's a good question. I mean, from my, our point of view, as a teacher, I would say, you know, curriculum should be built by the practitioners in the schools and districts where people live. Um, it's in, in, in multiple school districts, in a school districts with multiple buildings, I mean, there's plenty in Illinois that are one building, you know, yep. that's a school district. Um, but, but in places, Elgin, Chicago, obviously, other places where you have many, many buildings, I mean, sometimes there's even a debate within that community about can one district, one building have a curriculum that looks different than others. So those, I think, get worked out at, at the local level. I think that's appropriate. I would not be in favor of national curriculum. However, I would say this is an argument, I think, for you know, a set of national standards. Because when you get, again, it's, I see it as a civil rights issue. Why should algebra be different in Mississippi than it is from New York? Um, the standards kids should know uh, should be replicable, and, and so um, that's my view. But just to reiterate what you said earlier, Dan, even if it's locally developed, that the ability to share and swap and look and learn from other states and districts, particularly because we do have a lot of one school districts where there isn't as much, you know, um, uh, just sheer time um, and resources. So I would agree with you. I would just add that to reiterate the point you made earlier, that you'd like to be able to access and have, you know, the ability to peek at what other people are doing and learn. Hi, I'm Maureen Kelleher. I'm the mom of a four-year-old, and I'd like to ask about the intersection of Common Core and early childhood education. There's a lot of concern nationally that uh, basically the Common Core standards were backward mapped um, to make sure we got to a certain point, but there's questions that are raised about whether what we're asking kids to do in the K through three arena is developmentally appropriate, and there's a lot of question about whether, there's the, whether the assessment push is developmentally appropriate. And so I'm kind of curious what we see in Illinois and who's doing, com what I really want to know is, I'm hearing a lot of complaints from my friends who are parents of young kids, and this is from parents in Skokie and districts that are kind of held up as doing it well. So who is doing it right and how do we do Common Core in a way that's developmentally appropriate for young children? Yeah, exactly. so, uh, so that's a huge challenge. I just came back from Maryland. I was visiting, uh, I was doing some work there, um, and, and um, I have a grandson. And you're supposed to say, you look too young. <laughs> <laughs> you look too young. So I have a three-year-old yeah, three uh, grandson, and I, he doesn't have an iPad at home. And so I had an iPad. Actually, it was my iPhone. And, and you should see his very light touch with his finger 
but I have a friend who's a neurosurgeon and neuroscientist who says that the medium is still too cold for the connections to work. And so that children need social interaction to develop. And so, so the challenge for us, obvious, is, and so I think, you know, here in Anglewood, kids don't know their letters. Don't, they go to school and, you know, they're so far behind. And so there's this huge push to get them to know their letters and their words. And then right here, I, I think, you know, where's the lab school? Right it looks there. a little different, right? I mean, the, la the, the experience, experiential learning that children are having in this school is way different from what's happening just a few blocks. So I would look to see what, is the, what are the best getting, and I would love to replicate that. Jen? Hi, my name is Valerie Beavers, and I work with special needs people, and I am the parent of a child who had special needs, and I'm wondering how you, what are you doing to bring the special needs students up to speed uh, with this, this move in education, because I don't hear anybody talking about that. Can you talk about what your, what your district is doing? You know, they're, they're, they're part of, you know, in, in our district, uh, the special, you know, basically what we do is we build on special education teachers. And how do we, you know, the, the challenge always is individualized education. How do we get our, those, those students from where they are to where they need to be? And they're all not one group, right? So our, our students with learning disabilities ought to have something very different from our students who are multiple, multiply handicapped who may need much more of a life curriculum. And that's not gonna change that much because we want them to have life, uh, be able to be independent when they uh, are of 22 um, because they're gonna be with us for a long, long time. And so I, I think it really has to vary. Uh, one thing for sure is that the higher the standard, the higher the students for some reason um, perform because we have higher expectations for them. And so that is uh, something that, again, I support fully. And so, Dan, I'd be interested in whether or not you're seeing from your special education teachers any frustration with the Common Core yeah. and the supports that they're getting well, for Well, that's, I, I, that's what I was going to say. It, it, when we did that survey of 4,000 te mostly teachers, uh, one of the really ringing things we got back in comments was uh, concerns from our special education teachers about uh, about the implementation in their districts of the Common Core. And um, ag again, I mean, I think it's very early to be able to tell you specifically, here is the problem or, you know, here's the solution. Um, but I, I think it all goes to being very deliberate, careful about implementation as we go along because we're going to discover things as we go. You discover things as you begin to write the curriculum based on these standards. And uh, so, um, it's just, there's, there's no, I know people sometimes, you know, joke about how things move slowly in education. Um, I actually feel like the opposite is true, <laughs> that we so often move with sort of knee-jerk reactions to change things without pulling back and saying, let's just see how it goes this far this year. Um, and no one is uh, lacking an urgency to do what's right for kids. That's not the problem. The problem is, are we doing the right things for kids? So I think, you know, in terms of special ed, that's a key area, and English language learning, and early childhood, for, for that and, matter. And frankly, just to talk about one other thing, that, that, the, that, that the level of teacher preparation, there is a lot of work that needs to be done, it seems to me, generally, in as you're preparing teachers, not only in Common Core, but how do you integrate um, different populations? How do you teach to different populations? There's, there is, um, it's been segmented in a way that I think the reality out in the field is that you really need to have Every teacher needs to have an understanding of how to deal with a whole a variety of different student needs, and so we, we could do better there too. I, I would just add one, one other group that, um, I'm the entering chair for the Elgin Chamber of Commerce. And the work for, the, and we have a lot of manufacturing in our area for some reason. And what they're telling me is that, look, we need people ready for the workforce. How are you developing them? We need tool makers, welders, and so forth. And we have, there's a huge unemployment issue in, in this country. There's a huge underemployment, uh, an inability to get skilled workers in, in places that, that make uh, sometimes better than entering teachers, mm -hmm. frankly. And so we need to, again, as a superintendent, I'm trying to manage all of those concerns. And we have to figure out how best to assess and prepare students not only for college, and I believe that all ch children should be ready 
uh, prepared for college, but they also, a good number of them, are going to go right into the workforce or work their way through college. And so we need to figure out how to help them too. Why don't we take one last question? I don't want to pick. <laughs> Very briefly, my name is Dominic. Uh, this being the Institute of Politics, I wanted to ask the superintendent and the uh, union leader about uh, the fact that you two really didn't seem to clash a lot. I served in a school in Chicago last year through AmeriCorps, and Rob Emanuel and Karen Lewis just didn't seem to help at all the on the ground discussions about the Common Core or the strike or about even parents sending their kids to this school or that school. And I'm wondering about your thoughts on leadership and politics on the ground level. Hmm. Well, question. we get along really well because he's not in my district. That's right. <laughs> I don't represent his teachers. He's not even, no. Dan is especially charming. Jose is especially charming. Um, no. I, you know, I, I mean, uh, there are always going to, I, I would not let the uh, events of the last year to, rule, to forestall the possibility that teachers unions and, and district leaderships work together. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes all over the state, not just in Chicago, there are those conflicts that erupt. But um, I, I would say, I think it's, you know, the reasons we have, I have agreed with him is that, um, you know, we're facing the same things often daily on the ground. You know, hi, hi, him as a superintendent, his principles, uh, our teachers, um, the same challenges, the same frustrations with the, the lack of resources from the state, the same frustrations with, um, you know, with, with time and staffing and things like that. Uh, when, when his community, when, when jobs are lost, this is still a major issue for us in Illinois. You know, there are not enough people employed uh, and that affects, uh, you know, tax, uh, tax roles on the school districts. You know, as I've been saying, we could do all the best reform in the world. We could get all our standards right. We could get every teacher evaluation just perfect and implement them in districts. And none of that would have the same effect on the child as when one of their parents loses a job, which has lifelong effects for them. So these are things that we all care about together. And I, I think, um, I mean, as a superintendent, I'm a superintendent for the teachers in my district, not just for the administration, not just for anyone else, and I'm the superintendent for the entire district. And sometimes I have to take on teacher unions for the purpose of supporting students or parents or whatever else might be. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to lead all of them. And if I can't get, I'm, I'm not going to get to the destination without teachers. And so I value our teachers, I look to them, and I support them as much as we can. Um, I, uh, generally, I get the last, last question, but I want to cede the floor uh, to, uh, to any teachers in the audience who are actually working with these standards and may have uh, uh, questions. Some of them were asked on a sidebar with Arnie uh, before. but. Uh, Dave, you want to, why, why, excuse me? Why don't we have this question, then we can have a comment. Yeah, um, I'm Common Core. I worked with them. Oh. Well, thank you. Um, my name is David Gustal. I'm a high school English teacher. Um, the hearing of the secretary earlier in the conversation was taking place there in the conversation here. Uh, there are obviously a lot of concerns about um, teacher preparation, professional development, the time that teachers need to collaborate and discuss uh, curriculum and create curriculum that works best for students. Um, there seem to be so many concerns about um, the time that teachers have to develop materials and to work with students and to meet with students after school, before school. Um, I'm just wondering why we can't slow down. Uh, students are, are being affected in classrooms every day because teachers are so overwhelmed with the work that they have to do, dealing with initiatives that don't necessarily impact the classroom or the kids' experiences. Um, and so their time is spread really thin. Um, and I'm wondering why there's the rush. Um, no one is, is uh, against high standards for kids, um, and teachers care about holding that high standard. So um, why is there such a rush in implementing uh, assessments and 
coming. Why don't I take the first crack at that? Um, you know, look, like everything in life, you're trying to find uh, a balance of the right level of urgency and the right level of support and doing it in a careful, thoughtful way. And I don't know that anybody's ever going to entirely agree, but you're, you're working for that middle spot. I will just put one piece of context that I don't know that's been said yet today. Um, right now in Illinois, the single biggest powerhouse predictor of how well somebody's going to do in life is whether they're reading by third grade. And the number of kids who are reading by third grade in Illinois right now is 31%. And that, excuse me, 33%. And that number hasn't changed. You go back two years, five years, 10 years or more, that number hasn't changed. If you look at low-income kids, it's 16%. You look at African-American kids, that's 12%. You look at Hispanic kids, it's 18%. Those are not acceptable numbers. And the truth is, kids do rise to expectations. That matters enormously. Where you set expectations in states, there have been studies done. That's where kids cluster. So if Massachusetts standards are here, kids cluster there. If Virginia standards are here, kids cluster there. If Illinois puts its standards here, kids cluster here. It's not OK. We can't continue to have a third of our kids. And it has been too long. And so the urgency, I think, that you're hearing reflected is that we, we can't, it, of course you need to do it methodically, but you've got to find a balance. And if we wait till the perfect, till we get it absolutely, everything is, it will be another 15, 20 years. And that's, I mean, that's, you've heard the secretary say that. I happen to agree with that. And, and the question is, that's, that's another several generations. And so I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I am not, you know, and I've got kids in, the, in, in, in school right now. I've been a teacher. I, it's about trying to find that balance. But if you ask me where the urgency is coming from, that's where the urgency is coming from. Uh, can we take the question in the back? And I, let me just, we're, we're, we've held people after class here, so <laughs> if you could keep it uh, uh, somewhat brief. I certainly can. Every week, yeah. every three weeks, I had to give my kids, we were a test kittens of Common Core it was the SIG grant. And every three weeks, I had to give my regular ed kids in high school a standardized test that was ill-conceived, ill-designed, and gave me no feedback whatsoever that I could use. This rush to make our kids feel dumber every week is hurting children. Do you understand? It hurts children. And we have to stop it. You can talk about your high standards, but you do not understand. If a kid is here and you set your high expectations and standards here, as Mr. Duncan said, we expect them to hit the bar. I think it was a Freudian slip. I think he meant to clear the bar, but they're not. They're hitting the bar and they're dropping out. And that is what is happening. They are dropping out. Well, look, I can't, and I'll let these is guys Is there a question there? I don't know. I, well, <laughs> let me, no can there. Just, there isn't a question, but let me just a quick comment. I, I don't know by, you know, there's nothing written that says there should be a three week every three weeks. I mean, I, I'm with you. I'm sure that there are, the, yeah. So I, I wouldn't conflate if people are making decisions that may not make sense on the ground, that ought to be addressed and corrected. I would just hate to see that conflated with what I think is a larger. And Darren, thing. if I could, uh, um, yeah, I think yeah. I heard her mention that it was a SIG school, right? So for people who don't know, I mean, that's an important distinction because that's based on what are identified by the federal government as low performing schools. And our experiences, and I, my organization, we represent a lot of teachers in SIG schools all over the state, in Chicago, and North Chicago, and East St. Louis. And what happens in those scenarios, unfortunately, is terrible because um, through No Child Left Behind, there's a whole series of sanctions put on the quote unquote low performing schools. And you take places that are under resourced and have many challenges that other places don't have and lay even more on them. And, um, and we have been, <laughs> that's been a real frustration. And there's no question, and we, we have fought that. Um, I think this goes to someone's question earlier about why the rush. I mean, pure politics, I mean, I think there was a rush for the Obama administration to get a lot of change through. You know, while they had the chance and the political leverage to do it. Um, the, unfortunately, 
Um, some of that has resulted in what we would say is very bad policy for children in schools, and that's a perfect example. And, and I would just want to make one point. I know there's a comment here, and we might have to close, although people here can certainly stay maybe for a few minutes, I'm not wanting to ruin your dinners, but um, to answer some questions. But one point about Illinois that should be noted is that you know Illinois does not have a waiver under No Child Left Behind right now, and it's clear that the reason that Illinois doesn't have a waiver is because the law in Illinois that was negotiated with teachers unions and others around the table laid out a very reasonable implementation deadline for a staggered implementation for these new teacher evaluations for when student achievement needs to become a significant factor in those teachers evaluations. Um, because of the fact that it's staggered and not happening immediately at the same time as Common Core implementation, we don't have a waiver here in Illinois. Um, and that's something that I think should be noted by those here when you're looking at policymakers and trying to take things reasonable, take, take reasonable steps in order to actually implement policy in the right, in the right way. That's just a point that I wanted to make. But we have a, a last comment up here for this gentleman. I wanted to make sure he had a chance to speak. Hello? Yeah. My name is Paul Sally. I'm in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Chicago. I was on the initial committee in the 1990s from which the core curriculum emerged. This has been a very intense political discussion that has little to do with what the core curriculum is. So if you would like to find out, please join me in the Department of Mathematics anytime you want and I will explain how is it developed and what it constitutes and what is expected from the children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just want to, th I want to thank Darren and the panel and all of you for participating in this discussion. I'm sure it's not the last discussion we'll have, but it's certainly one of the most consequential. So thank you very much. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you.